Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34. I'm going to read from the New International Version. Are you ready? I'm going to preach good this morning. Amen. The anointing of the Lord is upon me. And I'm prepared to teach God's word. And it will delight your spirit and equip you and empower you for your next level. Amen. Matthew 6, 24. The Bible says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. We speak in there. No, you think it's Jesus, raise your hand. You think it's just the disciples, raise your hand. You think it's an apostle, raise your hand. You see, if you have been buying Bible, you won't even need revelation. The red letter Bible would have showed you that this Jesus speaking. You see, tell your neighbor, buy the Bible. I don't think I need to convince you more. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It's not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the head. They do not sow or reap or store away in bands, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And when do you worry about clothes? <laughs> See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows. Look at your neighbor and say, my father knows. My father knows. There's a way if you believe God's your father, you smile. Say, my father knows. My father knows. That you need them. Now, I'm not going to share the honorarium with you, so it's over. Right? Let me continue. <laughs> the three says, but seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow we worry about itself. Each day has its trouble, enough trouble of its own. I'm going to end this sermon where I'm starting from. Bible says, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow we worry about itself. What does, who does tomorrow's warning? Did you see that? Who does tomorrow's worry? That, that's in your Bible. So why is it that you are doing a job you are not going to be paid for? Why do you worry about tomorrow? When scripture says, tomorrow will worry about itself. I do not take somebody else's worry upon myself. Right? All things being equal, if you read on the newspaper and they tell you about a couple in the US that have been married for 30 years. And they don't have the foot of home, and they have done IV, have done everything. You are going to empathize with them, but you are not going to not sleep because of them. Because you don't know them. It's not your worry, it's their worry. Tomorrow's worry is tomorrow's problem. It's not your problem. You worry about you. The Bible did not even say you should worry about you. Many times, people are not worried about today. They worry about tomorrow. Therefore, I want to start by teaching you. I want to teach you today on what I titled Overcoming Worry, Fear, and Anxiety. Look at the name and say, Overcoming Worry, Fear, and Anxiety. Some of you are even afraid to say it because it's, it's been eating you up. Glory to God. Father, we thank you because today your word will come, distill upon our hearts, and after now we all shall be better people. Thank you because your counsel for our lives shall be established. Thank you because we will see what Jesus saw. And we'll understand the way Jesus wants us to understand. Thank you because we're empowered to live a life even for him. In Jesus' name I pray. Please have your seat in God's presence. Overcoming worry, fear, and anxiety. We live in a time where people talk about panic attack. People just say they're anxious. I read it that even the successful people have this trouble. Um, athletes, 
movie stars. They have panic attacks. They have anxiety problems. So that you being anxious, I'm not sure it is entirely something that is new. But it is something that should not be in the life of a believer. If you want to appropriately kill worry, destroy your fears and anxieties, then you must pay close attention to the things I'm about to teach you now. I mean that you may have had sermons before, but this one, this particular sermon, will liberate you, transform you, and deliver you. I want to encourage you to take notes. I want to encourage you to take notes, whether on your phone, whether on hard copy, you need this sermon for life and for destiny. Today, we are privileged to take a look at one of the greatest sermons that has ever been preached. One of the greatest sermons that has ever been preached. Matthew chapter 5, and chapter 6, and chapter 7 are actually a sermon. It's just one sermon that Jesus himself preached. So Jesus was on the mountain. But the mountain today that we call the mountain of Beatitudes. The mountain of Beatitudes that is... Uh, opposite and facing the lake Gennesaret and Capernaum. It was on that mountain that Jesus sat down and preached to his people. And he taught them Matthew 5, Matthew 7, Matthew 8. Interestingly, and unsurprisingly, it is the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. Of course, Jesus preached it. And it is the sermon that many people have preached from and many books have been written concerning it. Today, we are privileged to take a journey even to the mountain of Beatitudes. And we want to see and consider what Jesus told them on that mountain. I want to see wisdom for our life, wisdom for our destiny. I want to be appropriately located which wisdom will work for us in order to live the life Christ wants us to live in this time and in this generation. In Matthew 6, three times, between Matthew 6, 25 to 34, three times Jesus said, do not worry. Matthew 6, 25, Matthew 6, 31, Matthew 6, 34, he said, do not worry. Why would Jesus give that triune instruction in so little verses? It's because he understands that one of the problems we are going to face in our generation is the problem of worry, anxiety, and fears. Right? If you say you do not have fears and worries, it's because you have grown in faith. <laughs> but if you have not grown in faith, the other the reason why you say you do not have that is because you are lying to yourself. People actually are worried. They are worried about their future. And here Jesus was instructing and saying, do not worry. Perhaps you've been with me and I've cancelled you before. <laughs> and I said, do not worry. And then I walked away. And you feel like, that's what they would say. These pastors, they just tell us to not worry. And God will take care of it. Have you seen people come to you and say, God will take care of it. And then they expect you to start smiling after you are crying. I say, God will take care of it. Your future is, is located in God. I say, amen, amen. So they expect you to smile now, but you are not smiling. You know, I love the fact that Jesus is not like any of our pastors. Jesus is not like any pastor. He, he didn't only tell them not to worry. He actually told them the benefit of not worrying. And he told them why they should also not worry. So Jesus told them how not to worry why they shouldn't worry and the benefit of not worrying. It's not like me that I'll just look at you and say you should have grown by now. Stop worrying about relationship. How old are you? <laughs> you are just you are just 26. Oh, you still have uh, you still have your years in front of you. Or when I want to preach good, I say, you know, man is not born for marriage. Your purpose and your ministry. And then you look at me and say, but I'm bored and lonely. And I say, smile, dance. And then you dance and then the problem is still there. Am I speaking to somebody today? You know, you look at, you say, PFA. PFA say, don't worry. My bills are mounting up. My bills are mounting up. They are chasing me. Like grace chases believers. Somebody say, don't worry. I say, man of God, you don't understand. Dollar has gone up. People are not coming to buy goods as they used to. My business is in problem. PFA. I shouldn't worry. My marriage isn't working. What are you telling me? When people look at me, they see that my life does not amount to anything. I've made mistakes in my past and I'm paying the price now. And PFA, you say I shouldn't worry. That doesn't sound good at all. 
Say, I, don't, I shouldn't worry. You don't understand them. I don't have money. See, it's not, it's not all these bills. All these bills is American English. The gist is that I don't have money. Buy money. There's no money. I don't even know what I will eat when I get home. I say, I should not worry. Somebody say, you know, I'm sick. Forget the manicure, the pedicure, and the makeup. I'm sick. He said, I shouldn't worry. PFA, I'm worried. I'm worried. Thank God for God and thank God for Jesus. He never denied the existence of our troubles. And he never denied the existence of our problem. And in this sermon, I want to show you that Jesus actually truly really understands. The message and the sermon go far beyond even that time and that season, even to speak into us, even at our present situation. But before we proceed, even this morning, it's important to know what is worry. So let's start with some definitions here. So we just get that out of the way. Number one, worry is a sense of uneasiness and anxiety about the future. What is worry is a sense of uneasiness and anxiety about the future. I think about tomorrow and I'm anxious. I am afraid of my children. What will happen to them? What will happen to my kids? I'm afraid. See, I'm afraid. It's an uneasiness about tomorrow. Scripture actually indicates that such anxiety ultimately is grounded in our lack of trust of God. But let's, let's, let's continue with what worry is. It's a feeling of being anxious or troubled about actual or potential problems. It's a feeling of being troubled about actual or potential problems. Now, do you know that I, I, I tell people that it is valid to be worried and anxious about an actual problem? But eight, more than 80% of the time, we're actually worried about potential problems. Potential problems. I know people who take their children to school, drop them off in school, and they are worried that they will be bullied in school. Worried that somebody will beat them. Worried that they will come back sick. So that the child is in school, but they are not okay at home or in, at work. They are wondering what's going on. They always want to call the teacher. Why? Because they are worried. That is not a problem. That's actually a potential problem. To worry is to let your mind dwell on difficulties and troubles. Now let me shock you, and this is very, these statistics. These statistics. Now listen to this. Do you know that only 8% of your worries are valid? That shocks you, right? It shocked me too. Do you know that 92% of the time, what you are worried about never happens. 92% of your worries are ungranted and illegitimate. 92%. Worried that I will not get married. And eventually after five years, you are married. You see that? Worried that you won't have children. And then now you have children. 92% of our worries are not legitimate. That means that number one, they are not real. Number two, they will never happen. Number three, what you are afraid of will not come to pass. And then number four, you cannot even do anything about it. So they are just perceived trouble, a problem. Only 90, only 8% of your worries are valid. Do you know that if you have that understanding, you know you will sleep better, just 8%. I can assure believers that the things they are worried about are within the scope of that 92%. That's the reason many people cannot progress in life because they are worried. Now, listen to this worry, don't solve problem. It doesn't keep bad things from happening to us, it doesn't motivate you or even help you call. Now, let me say this to us anxiety is like a toddler. Anxiety is like a toddler, it never stops talking. And it tells you what you did wrong every time. And it keeps you awake at 3 a.m. If you don't have a child of four or five years, you don't understand what we are saying at all. 
But if you have a child of five years old, you understand what we're saying. You can't say I'm sleeping. Sometimes they just have a dream and they come and knock on your door and then you are awake. And then they also will tell you you are wrong because their teacher said something or somebody said something and the person lied to them in school. And you're trying to say, no, no, it doesn't work. Say, no, sir, that is not like that. He keeps talking. And he also tells you everything you've done wrong. Does that look like anxiety? Wakes you up at 3 a.m. and then you don't sleep again. Somebody says, I have, I have a dick here. Somebody says, yeah. Somebody says, yeah. You see, it's because the moment something woke you up suddenly by 3 a.m., you couldn't go back to sleep. You couldn't sleep anymore. And that's why we say anxiety is like a toddler. Over time, chronic worry will affect your job performance. It will affect your relationship. It will affect your appetite. It will affect your sleep. It will affect your lifestyle. Appetite meaning that you eat too much or you eat so little. Do you know when you are worried, you are always hungry? Or you are not never hungry? You just finish eating, but you are still hungry. Or you never even want to eat. One of the two will happen to you. It causes chronic emotional stress. Such as a suppression of your immune system. The reason some of us are ever always sick is not demo, is that you are worried. So your immune system that's supposed to be your defense mechanism is always weak. It's weak. So small thing, malaria, small thing, headache, pastor, pressure, pastor, pressure. It's not pastor that's the problem. It's worry that is the problem. I know we have become a generation that glorify and deify our mental health. So because we worship it and it's our God now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not speaking against mental health. But you see, we, we just find a valid reason to say I'm depressed. And we, we, we actually almost always almost glorify being depressed. Like there's no shame now. I'm, I'm just depressed. I'm depressed. I'm, and I ask them, if you see depression, will you know it? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say some of the emotions are invalid. I'm very careful on this stuff. But listen, dear friends, 90% of people who say they are depressed don't even know the meaning of depression. And some people love to be sad. They just love to be sad. What are you smiling for? It's not funny. Somebody knows you in the house. You don't smile. You see, you are attractive. You are attracting that demonic spirit. Uh, but don't let's go to demons. Let's just talk to science. Praise God. It causes heart disease, digestive issues. That food is not going down. That is worry. Is worry. There's no issue here. Is worry. And that's why I tell believers not to not be quick to point the hand at issue or the devil. Because you see, when you do that, you will be lying. And you'll be called, you will be accusing somebody wrongly. Because he doesn't know about it. So it is false accusation. You cannot be in Christ, rooted in Christ, hidden in Christ. And you are subject to every attack of the devil. It's a lack of understanding of how your body is supposed to operate. I'm say, when I eat at night, I cannot digest it. It is worry. It should have digested. You know, it causes BP, blood, blood pressure. I'm, have you discovered that on our streets now many young people are running and walking? I hope you know that it's not, it's not that they want to, it's not, they are not looking for coughs or they are looking for body shape. Their health is speaking because they are worried. Bills are rising. It's difficult to live in this country at this season if you're a salary earner. Just how I'm saying. If you are a business person, you can always increase the price. And say for Barbie here, it's 500, now it's 2,000. You can't buy, you can go. But if you're a salary earner, they will even be telling you how much profit are we making. So you are earning the same amount, yet your bills are increasing. School fees have come. So while your wife is sleeping, you are awake because school fees has come. Is somebody listening to me? It's three months to the end of your house rent. Three months. Three months. And for the last two months, you have not been able to sleep. Because the house rent, the landlord will not listen to praying in tongues. So you are worried. And that's cause BP, high blood pressure. And yet, PFA is saying, Jesus said, do not worry. I didn't say that. Jesus said, do not worry. And I want to show you the thing Jesus said we should not worry about. So that if it is the things you worry about, you can strike them out now. Is that fine? Can I show you the thing Jesus said, do not worry about? I want to show you specifically, Jesus mentioned certain things. Now, oftentimes the things we are worried about are personal needs. 
We just worry. You hear, you really see people worry about the nation Nigeria to the extent of not sleeping. People can talk about it. Ah, see this government. These people are not serious. But at the end of the day, they are snoring. Why? Because that affects them, yes, but it does not affect them to the extent of affecting their health. Therefore, when people talk about being worried, being anxious, uh, living in fear, it is because of personal needs. Personal needs. The need to be loved. Abraham Maslow talk about the needs of men. But don't let's go into psychology. Praise God. Let's go into scriptures. Uh, let's see Matthew 6, 25. I want to show you the first worry there. Matthew 6 and then 25. What did Jesus say? Read it if you find it. Let's just go to our church. Yes, ma'am. Take no thought for your life. Now, so let's stop there. Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, Take not, take no thought of your life. KJF will not kill me. The NIV says, Therefore I tell you, Do not worry about your life. That's the first thing Jesus said. Now, that's the biggest worry for many of us. Our life. Can I define your life to you so that you understand it? What will become of my life? Will I fulfill ministry? Will I attain purpose? Will I be LD at 40? Will the sickness of my father come upon my life? Will this mistake of the past 10 years, will I pay for it in the next 5 years? Will my marriage work? Will I find love again? Will I find love at all? Will my life matter? Will I make it? Will I fulfill my goals? Jesus said, don't worry. Do you know that if you can take that off, you can knock off 70% of your worries? Is that true? Because that's what we are worried about. Will my marriage work? Will I find somebody who will love me for me? I don't have money, but I want to get married. Until I break through financially, will a girl say yes to me? Will I ever even break through financially? Jesus said, do not worry about what will become of your life. The first three months after we started this church, I would sit at home, I would pray, read scriptures, pray, confess scriptures, pray, confess scriptures. And from Friday to Saturday to Sunday, I begin to, in a way, move myself away from so much human interaction to serious praying and just looking at scriptures. And then I'll read the Bible, I'll pray in tongues, and all through the night into Sunday morning, I would still be confessing and praying. And then I would then come 6 a.m. on Sunday, I would then arise and I would go to the bathroom and say, oh yeah, take your bath and let's prepare to go to church. And this Sophia work click on me and say, what if people don't come? What if they don't show up? And then God bless the day that the cloud is heavy. And then I will say, God, I'm believing that they come now. Rain. If rain, they won't come. And so fear and worry will stay upon me. And I've been praying and I've been reading scriptures. So one day the Lord said to me, is it your church or is it my church? Honestly, the way I was feeling, I felt like saying both. This is both of us church. The way I was feeling, I felt like saying both of us. It's you and me. We both have it. Because I can't be feeling this way. I say, I will not say it's your church. It's both of us church. And then I said, it's yours. And he said, if it is mine, then let me undo it. And I'll tell you, since I did that, did it now mean that people will come or people will not come? It doesn't really matter. You know why? Whether they come or not, you can't change it. The only one who can change it is God. So I'll stop bothering about it. If I see two people, I preach like a house on fire. If I see 50 people, I preach like a house on fire. I've stopped bothering. Why? Because my worry can't change anything. Even if they say they don't have transport and you call them by 9 o'clock, I say they don't have that's why they didn't come. If you send them transport, they will still not make that service. 
So why do you worry? The things you worry about cannot save you or can help anything. And I found in scriptures, the Bible says, He will keep you. You see, that's the assurance that the Lord will keep you. He will keep your life. He will keep you. And that's, that's a joy. And then number two, he said, Mark, can you continue? Matthew 6, 25. What did he say again? Not yet for your body. He said, not yet for your body. He said, do not worry for your body. Wait. Say, what you shall put on. He said, do not worry. The NIV says, what you shall wear. So the second thing Jesus said you should not worry about, he says, do not worry about what you should wear. Let me say this to you. Jesus really understand modern day pressure, don't you think? Ah, uh -uh. <laughs> We live in a society that addresses us the way we are dressed. Is that not so? How you show up determines how people value you. How many of you truly have pressure picking clothes to church? Raise your hand. Please, don't, don't hide. Real people. Praise God. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. And you're thinking, I think I wore that three weeks ago. I think I wore that two weeks ago. Real pressure, right? <laughs> thinking God. How about going to work? How many of you have pressure with clothes to wear to work? Raise your hand, please. Raise it properly. I've got a job. I mean, how so much we confessed for that job and believe God for that job. And then she got the job. And then our problem became what clothes will she be wearing every day? You see, how the answer to one problem will become another problem. Do you notice that? How the answer to a problem becomes an opening of a door to another problem. Lord, I want to get married. Father, I must get married. Yeshua Makapa, confess, pray. Now you are married now. That man, you are not praying again. Lord, how do I cope with this guy? Now you have a bigger problem. You are tired normally when you are tired and you came home like that, you sleep. But this one, his eyes is so red. He's hungry. Though he's tired, he has to eat. And he told me we not do. He wants a bar. He wants a book for food. That's what he wants. And you are tired. Don't forget you confessed and prayed for that problem. Now that problem now is very real. You see how worry start. Now, even when that guy just you now pray, Lord, the fruit of the womb. Now the fruit of the womb has come. You can't sleep. Because that child is always waking up where others are sleeping. I remember when I became a minister and the pressure was real. You know, I was going to church every day before every Sunday. It didn't matter. If you see me, you see me. If you didn't see me, it's okay. I can wear anything. Then I became a minister. Then I had to turn up every Sunday because I was climbing the pulpit every Sunday. A real problem. Very real. You have only two suits. How do you now approach a church of about a thousand people? How can I come? Real worries. But the Bible says, Matthew chapter 6 verse 30. Give me 6 30. You see, and that's very key. Very important. Jesus understands. Jesus understands that sometimes you need to turn up in your Ferragamo. You need to wear good clothes. Look at that. He said, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into fire, will he not much more clothe you? God says he will clothe you. You may not have a wardrobe of 70 clothes, but God says he will clothe you. That's an assurance. He will clothe me. I may not be able to buy an Instagram vendor, but I can buy in a co. Amen. He will clothe me. Do you understand what I was saying? God promised to clothe us. Then number three, what do we worry about? He said, do not worry about tomorrow. Matthew chapter 6 verse 34. The fear and the worry of tomorrow is the reason some people cannot be happy today. What did he say? Jesus said it actually very clearly. He said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow we worry about itself. The fear of tomorrow is the reason some people cannot be happy today. So that because you are looking forward, you cannot enjoy where you are right now. Some people cannot enjoy their 
journey of becoming. Why? Because of tomorrow. Is somebody listening to me? Do you know that this is the particular worry responsible for the Jaffa syndrome? The fear of tomorrow. You hear people say, ah, we are not going for ourselves. It's for our children. That's tomorrow. It's for the children. So because they know that they won't get a good job as they are going. At 54, they can't get a good jobs. At 54, somebody is, I know somebody who is going to start learning school discipline. School discipline. After she had read marketing, work in the bank, now she wants to go and start nursing at 54. When you finish nursing at 57, how many years is left? That kind of person is not thinking of making it, he's thinking of the children. The fear of tomorrow is why many people sell their houses to Jaguar. The worry of tomorrow. Pastor, sir, you can't blame us. You can't blame us. We thought Jonathan was bad. Look at Bubu. Now we thought Bubu was bad. Look at Bubu T. See where we are. Have you ever been enjoying the moment and then suddenly you remembered your unpaid house rent? You are watching Netflix, just flicking it away. And then suddenly your phone ran. Then you looked at it. It's Ope calling you. <laughs> Pampe calling you. If you don't understand that, leave it. I, I thank God for your life. But when they start calling you like that, you know they're not checking up on you. What's going on? That moment, you just lose the joy of that moment. Have you been enjoying a Friday moment? And then you remember your interview on Monday and fear comes and grips you. You remember an exam and fear grips you. It was Charles Spurgeon that said, our anxiety does not empty tomorrow of his sorrow. He only empties today of his strength. Listen, God will take care of it. Worry well, doesn't change anything. God will take care of it. And then number four, Jesus said, do not worry about what you shall eat. God, Jesus understands. He knows a foodie generation is there. He, he has something for the foodies. He said, listen, don't worry about what you shall eat. Matthew 6, 25 to 26. Now, this eats differently if you are hungry. It eats differently if you are a foodie also. It eats differently if you are a shawarma lover. He said, have you ever sat down JJL in your house? You were not looking at anybody. You are even fasting. And the aroma of chicken being fried just came at you. It was not your fault. So it aroused in you a different task and desire. Jesus said, do not worry about what you shall eat. Is it cool that Jesus thought about food, people? Is it cool that Jesus thought well about food? I think it's a good thing. I know you have some very spiritual people. Some of you don't eat at all. But I, I think it's good that Jesus thought about Pan and Yama and those of us who love Shahama and all of that. I think it's a lovely thing. Jesus said, do not worry. Do not worry. Somebody say, PFA, you don't understand. There's nothing in my house. I don't have to know. Jesus said, don't worry. And then number five. He said, do not worry about what you shall drink. Matthew 6, 25. And I, I, I think that, listen, Jesus is just a cool person. He actually understand these things. I don't know whether you understand what it means to drink. Have you ever been in the heat of Lagos? And the, and the sun is just high. And even though you are in a car, the car does not have AC. And even though the car has AC, it cannot be on because there is a fuel situation. That's what I'm saying. So you, you, you wind down and then the heat kept coming. And suddenly you saw somebody selling water, those water that looks frozen. You know, they are frozen like, ah! You just desire it. It's like the, the, the best thing in the world. Jesus said, don't worry about what you shall drink. What you shall drink is important. But Jesus said, don't worry. I don't think you get it because you don't look at statistics. Do you know that I have to say, is this is very important. But the Lord said, go and check things out. Then you understand how important drinking is. Then I found out that, do you know that annually Nigerians spend 2 trillion naira annually on soft drinks? 2 trillion, 2 trillion. Do you know if you want to plan your wedding, one of the things they will give you that is the biggest is drinks. Water, coke, malt. And if you are rich, juice. And if you are not born again, beer. No, I won't, okay, wine, yeah, wine. That, that's it. Wine per table. <laughs> and you don't want them to fill it at a coke. You want the original wine. Then you have to pay money. He said, don't worry about what you should drink. 
I checked that further and I saw that Nigerians spend 900 million naira annually on beer. With Gabasoni Avadi Ali I thought that was deep. You don't know drinking is important or you have a party to plan. Jesus said, Don't worry. Why? He said, God shall supply it. Don't worry about what you shall drink. And I feel I have the permission of the Christ to have the sixth one. Especially because I'm preaching to people on the island in Lagos. I think I have the permission of Jesus to say, do not worry about where you shall live. Am I speaking your mind? Am I speaking your mind? <laughs> Worry doesn't change anything. It, rather, it amplifies our problem. Listen, by worrying, we cause a permanent damage to a temporary problem. For a temporary problem. Anxiety does not come from thinking about the future, but wanting to control it. The fact that we have no control over the future is our problem. Actually, many guys are not afraid of not getting married. Can I say that to you again? Many guys are not afraid of not getting married. They don't worry about not getting married. Because they feel they control it. Many ladies actually are worried about not getting married because they feel that they do not have control over it. That man thinks I'm the one asking you out. When I am ready, I will ask somebody out. If you say no, I'll go to somebody else. But the sister has been watching and looking. And he's saying, PFA, you don't get this. I wish you do. The other guy who I thought was going to ask me out after like three years of just waiting and loving up on each other in what they call close friendship. Eventually, he has sent me a WhatsApp message with an IV to his wedding. PFA, PFA. <laughs> Anxiety does not come from thinking about the future, but wanting to control it. Except we let the Lord drive the car, we will not stop being anxious. Except we learn to surrender the control to him, we will not stop being anxious. Anxiety is us wanting to control everything about our life. If you have money, you are never going to be disturbed about paying house rent. Why? Because you feel in your account is the control. But if there's no money in the account, then there's no control. There's a problem. You are anxious about your relationship with your wife because you don't understand that woman. You can't control her. So you are worried. You are worried. What is the impact of worries in our lives? Number one, it cripples our faith. Matthew chapter 6 verse 30. Worry cripples our belief. We have a little faith. Worry breathes on our doubt. Breathe on doubt. The more you doubt, the more you worry. Listen to this. You cannot be bogged down in the land of worry and expect to enter into the fullness of God's promises. Where faith, where worry abounds, faith diminish. Where worry abounds, faith diminish. Worry is a faith killer. If you don't stop worrying, you will never be able to walk in faith. It's a faith killer. Listen to this. Worry is also a statement of faith. That I believe in contrary situations and conditions. That's what you're saying. That's why you worry. That that situation is bigger than me and God. That's why you worry about it. Where worry dwells, darkness rests. Where faith dwells, light rests. And that's the definition of depression. When you talk to people who are actually going through depression, not these people sounding depressed. They will tell you they feel like they are in a shit hole. I'm sorry about that word. But they say they are in a hole and it's a dark space and they don't see any light. Why? Because where doubt dwells, when people start doubting your love for them, they stop trusting you. But when light dwells, faith also dwells. Is somebody listening to me? Therefore, the more you build your faith, the more you are able to stamp out fear. So fear and faith are two sides, even of a different lane. You cannot walk in faith and walk in doubt or walk in worry or walk in fear. It will not work. Number two, what does faith do? The impact of worry, sorry, is that it limits our resources. 
It is a sign that you are looking only at your present circumstances to supply all your need. If your resources can't provide or solve your problems, it is legitimate to worry. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I just said? I said it is legitimate to worry if your source and your supply can't supply your need. It's legitimate. And therefore, I want believers to know today that your salary is not your source. So your salary meets your needs, but it is not your source. Your source is God. So that thing may be bigger than your present salary, bigger than your present income, but it is not bigger than your source. Why we worry is that we limit our life to the presentness of our situation. I don't know where I'm going to live, but I'm not going to live on the road. I don't know how it's going to do it. But he's going to do it. A brother in Lagos, a very, deep, a very good, good brother to me, called me and said, you know what? They've given me a quick notice. I said, that's not a problem. He said, you don't understand, sir. I said, I understand. It's not just a problem, you know. I mean, I don't see problem anywhere. Praise God. I said, it's not just a problem. He said, ah, we don't have the faith you have. I said, that's not the problem. He said, let me tell you. It's not that they have given me a quick notice. They have taken me to the court. So the court has actually just given me two weeks to either pay or get out. I said, that's not the problem. So we are going to pray. And then we prayed and I said to him, God, you are either going to provide the money or you are going to touch the landlord to extend the date. But one of it has to happen. Because that's the true solution I can find. And you know what? He called the landlord and said, sir, I can't find the money. Lano said, call the, call the lawyer. He called the lawyer. He said, I can't find the money. I need extension. They gave me extension. He called me and said, they took me to court without even telling me. Now they are giving me extension. I said, because God said they will give you extension. He said, what will not happen? I said, God will provide. God knows that our, your faith cannot get the money without extension. So it's extending so that he can provide. See, you have to understand that worry doesn't change anything. If people don't like you by worrying, you can't make them like you. Accept it. They don't like you. Let them go. That's your problem. Live your life. You worry what they will say, what they will think, what they will do. Your life will never amount to anything. Stop worrying. God is my source. Can somebody shout in this house? God is my source. God is my source. Let not the anxious, the Lord told me this two days ago. He said, let not the anxious soul say, I am walking in faith. For faith is resolute steadfastness. The anxious soul cannot say, I'm walking in faith. No. When anxiety comes, faith leaves. Let me, say, let me tell you what worry says. What it says, all can go wrong. That's what worry says. It says, all can go wrong. I can get to work today and they will sack me. I don't know why people think like that. It's a big problem. I can have carry over as a student. What if I don't graduate? Why are you thinking? Why, why, why don't you think? Why, what, what if I'm the best in my class? People don't worry about that, being the best in class. You know those who are best in class never worry whether they will be best. But those people who are, they worry whether they will graduate. I was in 11 and a lady came to me and said, I told me, some of the guys around me, he said, ah, that you're in 11 does not mean you get to 200 level. No, 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 people leave this school. It doesn't mean anything. In fact, some people don't announce it, the wise, they don't announce that they have admission now because they can send them away. So I began to go with that. Hey, hold on, Shannon, well, God will help us here. I began to go like that. Then I met a sister from my church. And then I told her, he said, what kind of nonsense is that you should be thinking of two one of us class? What are you thinking about like that? And I thought of her, I said, something's wrong with you. You are thinking, you are afraid of being making it. Why are you not thinking of buying a car? Afraid whether you ever find love. Why are you not thinking of, you are privileged, somebody's privileged to come into your life to love What he says, all can go wrong. Faith says, it shall all work out. It shall all work out. I don't know how, but it, will, it shall work out. God will work it out. I love that song. One thing I know, one thing I found, God will work it out. I don't know how he will, but I found it, he will work it out. How he will work it out. You are, you are looking for 200,000. You want to die. Somebody's looking for 200 million. Remember, it reminds me of a story. In a church, true life story, one guy was praying, Lord, do it! Lord, do it! 
Father, I need this money. Do it, Lord. And then he mistakenly said, 50K, I call you for it. There was a man there. He was believing God for two billion. Euros. The man called him, gave him 50K, said, be going. Let us face God. You see, don't waste our time here. The 50K was real problem to him. He said, oh God, you are disturbing me and God. Let him be able to answer people like us. You just take my lunch here. You see, we are looking for two billion. What you are thinking of is not somebody's problem. It doesn't make it illegitimate. But it just means that if God can take them there, he can take you there too. Number three, what does he, what happened? Because of what? Lack of peace. Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. The Bible talks about the peace of God that passes human understanding. What garries in your heart and your mind. Say so we should pray. Listen to this. Peace is the first thing that goes when you worry. The first thing that leaves the window is peace. And if the problem is not dealt with, our worries get worse and worse. Listen to this. Without peace, you cannot be creative. Without peace, you cannot walk in faith. Without peace, you cannot love. You can, without peace, you can't have good health. So the first thing that you need to ascertain for yourself is peace. Listen to this. I, I was thinking and meditating on this. And I, I want to say to you, that peace is the most underrated resource to any man. Listen, dear friend, if you still have peace, even if you have money, you can still make it. It's the most underrated resource available to man. For everything thrives in the atmosphere of peace. Everything thrives in the atmosphere of peace. And yes, what it takes out from you. A home that does not have peace, they can have cars, but that's not a good home. A life that is devoid of peace may have money and may ball every Friday. But you don't want to get into a relationship with that jargon of a guy. Why? <laughs> he doesn't have peace. When people don't have peace, they don't think rationally. Number four. What happened again because of worry? You can't listen to God's word. Let's see Matthew 13, 22. You see, worry chokes the word of God. It chokes the word of God. That's what worry does. It chokes the word of God. Have you read the Bible and you are able to get nothing from it? Because you are worried. As you are reading, your heart was traveling. As you are reading, your heart was traveling. You are listening to someone now in church, but your mind is somewhere else. That bill that has not been paid. That girl that does not like you. If she will tell you no, she will tell you no with seven inches, nine inches nail. Their brother be ready to receive it. It is the generation of men that receives no. Sleep at night. There's nothing wrong with you. That he says no does not mean the one who will say yes is not on by the corner. And dear girl, because you can't ask him out and you are drooling when you see him, does not mean you will still not find love again, even if it goes away. Don't allow your heart to be exposed to a rascal. You see him and you are worried about him every time. As a rascal, praise God. <laughs> the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes it. Making it unfruitful. That word unfruitful means it cannot be, it's not productive. The word is not productive in the life of a warrior. If you worry, the word cannot be productive. Say, man of God, how is it that you can believe God like this and keep pro proclaiming God's word, professing it, making this on God's word? Because we have peace. Peace like a river. Attend your soul. Listen to this. The first parameter to hearing God is the serenity of the heart. The first parameter to hearing God is the serenity of the heart. Somebody say, I can't hear God. I can't hear God. You can't. You can't. Look, look, at, look at your heart. It is more busy and crowded than Osho the market. Look at that. They are coming and going. No rest in your heart. And yet you are saying, that's not the man for me. God did not see anything. You did not hear anything. You cannot even hear anything. Let's start from there. 
Number five, a warrior is not able to love. He's not able to love. Apart from the fact that he, can, he cripples his faith, he limits his resources, uh, he, it's a, it, 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 it takes away his peace, he can't listen to God. A warrior is not able to love. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Worry admits to focusing on our own needs rather than the need of other people. When you are consumed with your own problem, you can't love people. You can't even see them. You can't see them. So every time they are accusing you of being selfish, maybe you are selfish. Maybe you are. Maybe you are. Because a warrior can't see other people's problems. They are thinking, I, I, see, I even know that these people are not even well. Are you expecting me to call you? Or oh, even think about it? I have not paid my bills. I'm hungry. I'm sad. It does not mean that the love that those people want to show to you, their emotions are invalid. Listen to me, this. Your problem does not invalidate the emotion of the other person. Therefore, it is important we care. I'm going through stuff. We all are going through stuff. News flash, CNN, breaking news. We all are going through stuff. Praise the Lord. Man is born unto trouble. It's a few days. I'm born to trouble, Job said. Listen, we all are going through troubles. The trouble of a big church pastor is not the trouble of a small church pastor. Amen. The trouble of a man in the Koi is not your trouble. Look at how much you're looking for for house rent. Less than half a million. For house rent, he's looking for almost 20 million. You see that trouble? With you? When your trouble sees trouble, it will bow. Somebody wants. My father-in-law was telling me this story. Somebody came. I was sharing. I was sharing. I was sharing. He said, pa, he said ah, God wants to kill me. God does not love me. And he's talked about it. I've not been married. I've been good. I'm a virgin at 37. I can't get married. Things are not working. My business is not working. Ah! As he finished, he said, okay, it's okay. Do you know Sister Akini? She's also not married. Her husband died. She knows that she's sick. What should we do? How can we pray? She started talking about prayer now. <laughs> Why? Because he has seen that I don't have a problem. You see, one of the ways I can encourage you as your pastor is to share other people's trouble with you. <laughs> so that you can now see that ah, you're actually enjoying life. So what some of you call trouble is because you are not made in the fire. You are a baby. You are a baby. That's why you are crying over things. My mom does not love me. My mom does not love you. Because she does not call you. She doesn't love you. <laughs> That's what we are saying. A generation has become. See, somebody was crying. See, you can't find. There was no picture of her when she was small. That means that they were not expecting her. <laughs> and they paid your school fees to masters in the UK. Sister, I don't know what love is. I don't know what love is. Boys who are selling recharge card to go to school, you are saying they don't love you. They are collecting like 20k a month, they don't love you. Boys are sent from Lagos to school in Illinois with 5,000 naira throughout the semester. Throughout the whole semester. 5k! 5k! And when they are in need, they are called their parents, their parents will send them cash 500, they will sell it for 400. And that's how they go for another two weeks. You, you are spending 20k. That is coppers, co members were earning at that time 12k. You are in 20k. You say they don't love you. I don't know what love is. In fact, I don't even want to know what love is. I, am I saying that that is not a legitimate thing? It is legitimate for her. But what we worry about is because we stay in our own cocoon, we don't look at other people. When you see others, say, My marriage, I don't have peace. Is your, you had the trouble. You had the trouble. Keep complaining that the salt is too much. Maybe she tries to cook. Maybe she tries to cook. She tries to cook. Even when she, she tries to cook, you are complaining of salt. Some people are only saying, let her even give me water. They come back. She's asleep. Asleep. They wake up. Baby, it's been a tough day. And she rolls and goes. And you are complaining that salt is too much. You are supposed to even speak more salt and say thank you for your energy. <laughs> Our trouble reduces because, and that's what the devil does. He tries to amplify our problems 
to make us believe that we are the greatest problem in the world. You don't, baby. You don't, brother. I remember when we started the church and then I was having a conversation with a pastor. And I was talking about how that this man now was, he has a church now about 2,000 people. And I remember that the first five years of their church, they were less than five, they were less than 30, 40 people in the first five years of their church. And now they are, so I was talking to him and I say, oh, you know, <laughs> the people are not really coming. <laughs> he said, but, he said, how are you now paying the rent? I said, the Lord sends that. He said, don't you think that's something to thank God? Why are you now complaining? The supplier supplies the money to pay the rent. Right? You are complaining that the people, are you the owner of the people? She is the one sending it. So what's your trouble? You see, many things, you know, it could have been worse. If people did not come, I can't pay the rent. You know what you would do? You shut down and go home. <coughs> the people that can make it will make it. Those who can't make it, that's the end of your ministry. So that the ministry continues. It's something I go for. Can I say something to you? The fact that your ministry continues, that's your life. Your life is your ministry. The fact that it continues, it tells me there is hope for you. It tells me there is hope for you. I'm trying to say this is how to deal with worries. It's not big. Because it's not bigger than God. Can I equip you very quickly as I close here? So Jesus said not to worry. If you are not going to worry, what are you supposed to do? Number one, fill your soul with information and knowledge on the faithfulness of God to you and other people. Fill your soul with information on the faithfulness of God to you and to other people. One of the things I tell people to do is to take a book and open a book that you are calling your faithfulness book. How that you were stuck two years ago, write it down, how the Lord provided. How that you thought there was no way out, write it down, how the Lord provided. When you read the faithfulness of God to you in years past, you will know you can do it again. But you know what we think? We think our memory is enough to serve us. But we forget. We forget. The problem you have is not a big problem. You have faced bigger problem and the Lord solved it. Have you forgotten many years of no admission? Have you forgotten many years of no food? Working in the street of Lagos? Now you have a job. If it took you from that place, it can deliver you from what you are facing right now. Remind yourself of the faithfulness of God. To you and to other people. Oh, I'm expecting the fruit of the womb. Hear testimonies of those who waited for 15 years. Let the story of was that, that was that no, that's not Ruth. Samuel's mother. What's her name again? Hannah. Let the story of Hannah inspire you. Let the story of Abraham inspire you. If he did it there, he can do it again. Is somebody listening to me? The reason we share testimony in church is so that when you find somebody who, is, who has just gone through what you are going through, you know it can do it for you also. Somebody say, I don't have a boyfriend. Is there a boyfriend you need? Is there a husband you need? What if you have a boyfriend and they never ask you for marriage? One person puts it out and says, please, I have a problem. So what's the problem? He said, I've been carrying a ring for seven years. Uh, that's not a ring. That's an anchor. For seven years. Look at you. Nobody has given you a ring, but your situation is better. You don't have that emotional trauma. At least you are waiting for somebody to come. This one, you say somebody has come. And for seven years, somebody has come. He should have sent a message like John to Jesus. Say, are you the one or should we expect somebody else? <laughs> Fill your mind. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, this was Samuel's mother. After she had gone through what she had gone through, he said, God is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. God is a God of knowledge. That's why you should listen to testimonies of other people. Number two, your life is of value to him. Understand that your life, and that's exactly what Jesus was saying. You know, Jesus said, look at the lilies. They never saw, but even, not even Solomon in all his glory is as beautiful as this guy, as, as the flower. He said, how much, he said, that flower that today is and tomorrow is no more. He said, how are you not of much value than the lilies? 
I thought I thought I ain't bad. You pass Lily now. Do you think God will look at you and Lily and God will save Lily and not you? I know you have more value. Jesus was trying to say you have more value. Somebody said to myself, yourself, I'm of more value. Jesus said, look at your life. It's more important than the best of the heaven to God and God feeds the bed of the heaven. If you will do that, won't he feed you? See, have you, some of you are born in rich homes, so you've never used your faith for things like this. But have you, have you been down and out before, financially? Down and out. No, nothing to sell. Nothing. Everything was okay. But you had nothing. <laughs> have you been there before? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. How are you now alive today? You didn't die there. It came true for you. I have been down and out. I think it was quite recent. I, I, I told Fred was saying something else. I said, oh, you don't have, you don't have. I don't have anything to give. Nothing. I'm down and out. Praise God. We are fine, but we are out. So, <laughs> anything you don't have in this house, you don't have. What you have is what you use. Amen. And the next day, I was coming back. So I went somewhere. I was coming back. And I bought shawarma. So he, he should have known I didn't kill somebody. I was out, but I was not out for long. Why? Because the Lord has a way of supplying. Not even from here, from you people. People would even labor for the. You all say, pop in your mind. I all lose my show. <laughs> Thank you for putting in their mind. Can I move the mind? Even in this season, if you call people to help you, they will, they will deny you. You know that. People don't have extra. Somebody was telling my wife, and I was, she was saying, you know, in the Christmas period, I just buy rice and then I share to people. She said, do you know what? I can't even buy rice to share with anybody this year. Now, those people who depend on that rice, you know, they have entered trouble. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure we look at things that way. Somebody else was expecting. What were Wala by? Those ones. December period like this. If the Lord does not supply from another place, they're in trouble. So when they say the system is hard, it has a way of affecting us. People sit on chairs, not tables. Can we continue? Yeah. Number three, rest in the supernatural provision of God. He will take care of you. He is a loving father. If you will ask him, he will take care of you. Ask, he will receive. Seek, he will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. The Lord will supply all your needs. I know 419. I know 419. You know what is 419 to you? People will do people. Fred. Ah, uh, Fred. But there is a supernatural and a spiritual 419 that has a way of submitting to all of our needs and providing that which we need. 419 Philippians. The Bible says, and my God is able to supply all, not some, all of my needs. All of it. Look at you must say all of it. What does all mean? Now there's a problem there. The Lord is able to supply all your needs, not all your wants. You need clothes. You don't need a Gucci. Yes, yes, you need a car. You don't need a Benz. Benz is a want. Car is a need. You need a house. You don't want a duplex. Banana Island is different from Agungi. Is somebody following what I'm saying? So there is a need, there is a want. The Lord, the Lord supplies your what? You need a wife. Wants is shape and figure. It has to look like this. Our glass wants me. What you need is a wife. What you need is a husband, not steady. Are you following me? It's not six packs. What you need is not what you want. God knows how to fulfill the desires of our mind. If your desire is carnal, the Lord will not supply it. You can be born again and have carnal desires. You need a phone. 
The Lord will supply with a phone. Not cat eyes, three cat eyes at the back. <laughs> iPhone. I saw one. You turn this just now. Oh, praise God. Yeah. I'm so far behind. I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm not worried. I'm so good. I'm so I thought I was far behind until I met somebody with seven. <laughs> I mean, when you times two, seven times two is 14. He's so far behind. <laughs> but he's still fine. And yet, people on 12 cannot sleep because they want to go to 15. The truth is that the difference between 15 and 12 is technology. They can't understand what is for God. They use iPhone for his picture. Just go and buy a Canon camera and wear it and be taking it around. It's even cheaper because that's what you need. What does Lord supply? Say it again, my needs. My needs. What does He supply? You will not be hungry. It doesn't mean you'll be able to eat in Chinese restaurants. A time will come, you'll be able to afford that. But at this stage, take your macaroni at home and enjoy it. Are you following what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? There is a woman that sells good for the rice. <laughs> eat it and enjoy your life. Instead of wanting a VI Instagram, because they will collect money of rent from you. You understand what I'm saying? We don't have trouble. It is that we have Ojuko Koro. And may the Lord give you understanding if you don't understand your It means insert in your eyes, literal translation. <laughs> It simply means it's the greed that's the problem. It is not the need. Look at how the Lord has supplied last one year. If you have kept it and saved well, you would have paid your bills. But the problem is you are living in a house you can't afford. Can we tell ourselves the truth? You can't afford the house. Leave it. Leave the house. Leave the house. Leave the house. You don't need the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you now. Leave the house. As your pastor, I'm telling you, leave the house. It's simple mathematics. If your income for six months, cannot pay your house rent for one year. Leave the place. I said six months because I want to help you because I know you want to live above your means, but I'm just trying for you. Six months. I'm not saying I will do that. My own is four months. You understand what I'm saying? If it cannot, stop saying I will use faith. If faith does it one year, it will fade the second year. But God expects you to use wisdom. We walk by faith. But everything that is in our house is by wisdom. I won't say more than that. By now, you're having a designer to clothe you. Who should clothe each? You either go to Balogo and clothe yourself. Am I saying that I want you to be poor? No, sir. But you see, there is a way we live in Lagos that make people continue having debts on their head. They just want to feel a monk. You are buying a Prado. The tire goes down now. Your, your problem is Jesu. Tire is 50k for Tokumbo. Brand new 150. Four tires. You are almost thinking of buying a Huber. <laughs> Just four tires. I'm saying to you that Lee, I celebrate those who can afford it. If they can, let them use it. If that guy takes his Prado around you, celebrate God on his behalf. Don't envy anybody. But sweetheart, you don't have to buy a Benz if all you can get is a Toyota. Sweetheart, I will, we're going to buy our first car. Thank God for sweet and smart brothers and friends. We're looking for a Benz. I saw a Formatic. Awesome car. Hey, saloon. I said, my God, he said, I entered, he started, he said, for no shiamba. I told my wife, I said, I've, this one, we will have change left. I said, praise God. I called a friend and said, your first car, sir, let me advise you. Don't buy a Benz, buy a Toyota. It was what delivered me from Foley. Maybe I would have come to Lagos with bike. <laughs> Number four, live a life of prayer and faith. Believe in his supplies. Worry is a signal that faith is failing. It's a signal that faith is failing. When we don't trust him enough, our heart starts to shake. Will I get married? Will I have my own children? 
will I ever graduate? I remember the story of a man that is called George Muller. Now I have to stop this. Now. I remember the story of a man that is called George Muller. George Muller is one of the God's general. George Muller lived in a time in the 1800s in a place called Bristol. And he was called to help the homeless girls at that time because that time homeless girls were taken into certain houses where they were just beaten, defeated, and it was a lot of trouble for them. So he began to bring them in and he was a son of a lawyer, a famous lawyer, but he had left the father. He just wanted to leave our faith. He believed that when we pray, the Lord supplies, he doesn't supply, that's fine. And there were girls, so one day, he had about 100 girls staying at that home at that time, and his wife came and said, there's no milk for oats tomorrow. And he told the wife, let us kneel. And they knelt down and prayed. The Bible says, ask. You see, it's the simplicity of faith that makes us doubt it. Is that faith is too simple. It's too simple that we are a generation that seeks the complicated. Instead of us to just kneel and pray, we will say, after we kneel and pray, and you stand up. You have to say, show that standing. That's the end. Especially if you marry somebody, that's the end. Ah. <laughs> Man, they are coming tomorrow. They will start telling you the truth. He prayed and said, let us pray. Two persons came again and prayed with them. And they left. And they continued the study. Hours later, somebody sent letters. And they received the letters and they opened. The wife was jumping, opened the letter, opened the letter, and they opened it and found money that was able to take care of the men. Listen, that man had, he never reached money. And for many years, his supplies came by the simplicity of prayer and faith. Just kneel and ask. Whatever they needed, they knelt and asked. Can I ask you, have you ever knelt to believe God for anything? Listen, worry thrives where information abounds. Faith thrives where revelation abounds. Dear friends, people are still eating of vines they did not plant. People are still taking houses, living in houses they did not build. God is still supernaturally supplying for people. People are still getting keys of cars they did not buy. They are still getting it. My mentor came to Lagos to start a church. And the church was starting the first service in a home. There was no money, not so much money, just following God. And just there, and he said he was sleeping in the hotel. And the Lord said, stand now and go to the hall. He said to go and do what? The event starts at 5 o'clock. What am I going there for? And the Lord said, go now. And he went there. And at the gate, he saw a man. The man said, ah, yes, what are you doing here? You know, we're just, um, the Lord said we should come and start um, a ministry here. So, I mean, the hall inside this hotel is where we're using. I've been looking for you, Rev. How can you be looking for Rev? He's everywhere. How can you be looking for him? Sure, I've been looking for you, sir. One time you came to our church, we were believing God for babies. And you made a call that there are pers people, persons here believing God for food. They should come out. And then you just prayed the prayer of faith. And then we had twins. And see, God has changed our life. Uh, if you are in Lagos, that's our church, sir. That's our church, sir. We are coming. We are joining you in that church. There's no need to pray. We are joining you. I mean, you are the one who blessed us. And we are children. We know you carry the blessings for us, sir. And I mean, you think that's just two people joining. Is that not so? And then he wrote a check. My mentor said he has never seen that kind of money before in his life. In his life. It was $70,000. <laughs> Be real. Have you seen seventy thousand dollars? They stopped. They stopped thinking for rent. They started looking for place to buy. Are you following what I'm saying to you? The Lord supplies. I have seen the Lord supply. The reason we are worried is that you can't trust the Lord to supply your husband. Not that good you are following. To supply a husband. You can't trust God to supply a job. Not that useless one that you are doing. You can't. When you start trusting the Lord, you will supply. You don't have a devil problem. It's not your family people following you. And then number five, you need to live differently. Number six, put the king and his kingdom first. 
Matthew 6, 33 to 34. We are called to seek the kingdom. What Jesus said here looks like what Elijah said to the widow of Sarafat in 1 Kings 17, 8 to 16. Say, go and do my own first. Go and make flowers, do my own first. And he did it first and she never lacked anything. God is saying, seek my kingdom first. You know why we are a little bit in trouble? We don't do anything for God. And I'll say this unashamedly to everyone under the sound of my voice. You don't do anything for God. Evangelism, zero. Invite people to church, no. Use your social media for God, no. But you want God to, is he an ATM? He's the God of Israel. You know the relationship we have with an ATM? I've never seen anybody who goes to an ATM machine and then, mm, I hug you, hug the ATM. I start laughing at the ATM. You will think he's mad. Why? Because people only go to the ATM machine to receive money. But that's what you do to God. You go to him only when you need something. God is in need. And the kingdom is about seekers. If you will be available to him, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and every other thing shall be added to you. What the Gentiles seek after is an addition for the believers. But it is not an addition for us because we are not seeking after the things of the kingdom. And some of us are more stingy than the us in front of National Theater. <laughs> Have you seen the us in front of National Theater before? Ben, you know the us. Yes, you know TBS, you know the us. You see how the us is? It's fully like this. <laughs> it is easier to collect money from the devil's hand than to collect from you. Offering? Bah. Tight? No. You have doctrine for everything. But when it comes to paying for NSC, you don't have doctrine. When it comes for you and the babe and them gangs to spend money, no doctrine. But when it comes to the king that advances the kingdom, you suddenly don't have time. You suddenly don't have money. And then you suddenly don't believe in it. <laughs> you have heard them say, I don't believe in it. When people tell me they don't believe in it, I, I just sometimes feel like, <laughs> I say, just tell us you are national theater donkey. I busy us now. Don't, you don't believe in it. What do you believe in? Do you know that I was teaching us on financial stewardship and I said that the way you spend money tells me what you believe in. The way you spend money tells me what you believe in. All of your, half of your income is spent on entertainment. That's your God. Netflix subscription, DSTV subscription, cinema. Somebody is looking at it. Cinema. Yeah. Data. Right? You see what you spend money on? Data. That's your God. Praise God. Fuel to watch football generator and all of that. Behold your God. Finally, believe that tomorrow will take care of itself. Matthew 6 34. Give me Matthew 6 34 and let us close. Believe that tomorrow will take care of itself. Did I say say it? I said, believe it. Tomorrow will take care of itself. I know tomorrow will take care of itself. Don't help tomorrow in worrying about that problem. Let tomorrow take care of itself. Give me that scripture very quickly, man of God. Matthew 6:34. I'm done here. Matthew 6:34. Very quickly. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Tomorrow has sufficient trouble in it. Don't bother yourself. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow we worry about what? Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't have high blood pressure. What tomorrow, whether you will sell, whether, don't think about it. Each day has enough trouble. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Help me go to five people and preach this sermon to them and say, tomorrow will take care of itself. How can you reach five people sitting down? Five people. Come on. Tomorrow we take care of itself. Five people are waiting on you. Are waiting on you. One, two, three, four around you. <laughs> no. Go tell somebody. Five persons. Tomorrow we take care of itself. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Rise on your feet.
Sing it one more time. 